Hi, I'm Stacy Souther, the director of Valerie. And you can find the film at ValerieMovie.com and the GoFundMe is there as well. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show. We're going to be the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented director who is the director of an amazing documentary called Valerie, which is, of course, based off of Valerie Perrine's life currently and broach is a very interesting subject which i'll let him talk about we are joined today by the ever talented stacy souther how are you doing today hey how are you thanks for having me for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're bringing to two geeks talking i originally moved to california in 1999 i you know i came for acting and i fell into filmmaking uh because of david arquette and christina arquette probably about 2014. I kind of fell into, into the filmmaking part of it and this thing came up with Valerie and I uh, wanted to do a documentary about her. You know, I wanted to honor her and her legacy and her life. So what is the documentary about? Well, the documentary is, of course, about the divine Miss Perrine, Valerie Perrine, one of the, I think, one of the most amazing movie stars, actors, one of the most beautiful women ever. You know, maybe I'm a little biased, I don't know. It's about Valerie. It's kind of a nice slice of her life growing up, her years in Vegas, uh, how she became a movie star. And then the second half of it is about her battle with Parkinson's disease, which um, a lot of people don't don't know about that. That's the, the one thing I was struck by when watching this documentary, because you see the, the vivacious life that she lived, the talent that she has on the screen. And then you're struck by a never-ending battle with Parkinson's, and it's truly a, a, a amazing shift as well, in not only the, the film, but in anyone's life. Oh, no, 100%. I mean, I, I Parkinson's is, any, I think any, well, any disease is horrible, but I have to, I, just because I have experience now because of Valerie, anything neurological, I think, is just a horrible, horrible disease because... With Parkinson's, it slowly robs you of who you are. You know, everything that makes you the amazing person that everybody knows and loves, those things are slowly taken away from you. It's a bitch of a disease. It's just it's just a horrible, horrible thing. And to watch someone you love go through that, it's pretty tough. And I'm sure, you know, anybody that has a family member or a close friend that's gone through anything, uh, cancer, what mental illness, like anything, it's really tough to to watch somebody go through anything like that. Looking at this documentary then here, why was it important to create this film? Valerie wanted to do a book on her life for years. And you know, she had an amazing outline and all that. It just never quite happened. I think she was busy with other things. And you know, you always have that idea of, oh, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later. It just never quite came to fruition. and. You know, I met Valerie 2006, and we became really close friends. We're like family. You know, I, you'll hear me say it. She's like my mother, and she truly is. You know, so I was saying, somebody should do a documentary about you. And this was years ago before streaming wasn't even a thing yet. And documentaries hadn't blown up the way they have now. But I just thought, you know, that'd be a cool way to tell your story. And what actually happened was she was going to have brain surgery, which you see in the film, and when that was going to happen, I knew that was a once in a lifetime thing. Like I needed to capture that. I needed to shoot it. So I literally borrowed somebody's camera, a little DSLR. I snuck it into the hospital and, you know, I would kind of shoot. I kind of had it down by my side and I would kind of shoot. And when nobody was in the room, I would, you know, put it up there and ask Valerie some questions or whatever. And that was the start of the documentary. And also, you see a little bit of this in the film. After she had the surgery and went home, I stayed with her for two weeks just to keep an eye on her. You know, brain, I mean, brain surgery is no joke, you know? So I, I stayed upstairs. She had like a loft and I, I stayed up there and just to make sure everything was okay. You know, I just kind of fell into making the documentary, you know, and it just kind of, kind of spiraled from there and became what it became, you know? 
looking at the amount that you've had to film for this documentary, because I'm sure there was a ton of footage that you, you weren't able to use and, and subjects you weren't able to, friends and family you weren't able to include in the film. What were some of the, the, the people that either you approached or they approached you when they heard about this film that you weren't able to use that would have maybe also helped in promoting? I mean, I was lucky getting a lot of people. I mean, names, as you know, we would say. But some people that I did want that I didn't get, Dustin Hoffman. Mm -hmm. I tried every way in the world to get Dustin Hoffman. I, I still don't know if he knew about the film. Howard Hessman, who's a great friend, and he's also in the documentary, Johnny Fever, WKRP, you know, passed away earlier this year. Super sad. Uh, but again, he was a very, really, really close friend, and he was a huge lover of Valerie, huge supporter of the documentary, and he was friends with Buck Henry, and he even, because Buck was friends with Dustin, he even tried to get it to Dustin through Buck, and I don't know if that ever happened, but, you know, Dustin was one, Robert Redford, I think I tried Jane Fonda, I tried uh, Jack Nicholson, you know, and Jack doesn't do anything anymore. Like he doesn't do interviews or anything. So those are some people I, I didn't get that I wanted. And there were a few people that said they would do it. And it's that chasing game. Oh, I'll do it. Sure. And then it's, you know, you get in contact with, with them and well, I have to go and I have to go and do a movie for uh, two months. Call me in two months. So it's chase, chase, chase. And then in the end, a few people were like, well, you know, I really don't know her that well. I don't really have anything to say. Why didn't you just say that in the beginning? It would have been cool, but, you know, because I got to tell you, to me, I mean, I think everybody that's a filmmaker, you know, they go through different things. One of the worst things was just making those calls. I don't know why, because just making a call and saying, hey, I'm calling on behalf of Valerie Prime, blah, 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 and you got to talk to a, a, you know, a PR person or a manager or whoever. I loathed making those calls, but, you know, most of them turned out really well, and, you know, I did get a lot of really great people. Jeff Bridges, Angie Dickinson, Stacy Keach, uh, George Hamilton, Richard Donner. Come on, late great Richard Donner was nice enough to let me interview him. Lonnie Anderson, the new Miss Tessmacher on Supergirl, uh, Andrea Brooks. She's amazing. I, I do want to throw in a couple of people that that I got, but because it was going to be a feature originally, and then I decided to do it as a short because I thought it would be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. I wanted to see if I could get it into the Oscars. You know, I wanted to see if I could get it qualified. So I was, I, I had a certain plan that I was doing. Alex Rocco, if you remember Alex, uh, you know, he's in The Godfather. And I mean, he was in tons of things. Amazing person. He, I interviewed him, like, I love him. And he, such great things uh, he said about Valerie. And and I didn't know it then. He didn't say anything. I, he was already sick. Like, he passed away, like, not long after I interviewed him. But when I shortened it up, I, I couldn't quite fit him in anywhere. Like I, uh, Rocco was great. Felipe Rose and the Village People. Uh, when I did, there's you know there's a, a can't stop the music section. I wanted him in it, but it, it just didn't quite fit for some reason. And there's a few people that were that were really great that I, I you know I, I I kick myself, but maybe you know I can put them in extras or something at some point. But there's a you know uh, I was lucky to get everybody I got, and everybody was so loving and and they care so much about valerie and they they hold her to such a high esteem it was just nice to get all those people that i got and they said like amazing things and actually a side note after i would shoot whoever it was i would take valerie i'd show her the interview and i think that that in a way was a kind of therapy you know because she was going through this stuff as i was shooting everything of course you see it but you know it's nice to I'd take Jeff Bridges or George Hamilton or whoever I'd, I'd shot and I would take it over and show her the interview and they're saying all these great things and about, you know, it's all this respect they have for her as a person and an actress and about these great memories and all that. And I think that was a happy little accident, bonus, whatever you want to say, kind of a therapy for what she was going through, you know, because it's uh, when you get sick with anything, I think that besides family, people kind of fade out of your life a little bit you know, they, you know they're doing their thing or they it's hard for them to see you or whatever i think that getting sick can be very lonely and i think that this was a nice little bonus that not that she was she never complained or anything i'm not getting saying that 
I'm saying it's nice to have something to brighten your day up, something to, to like reminisce about. Like, oh yeah, that time on Johnny Carson, or oh when I was shooting Bob Fosse and blah blah blah. This is such a great time in my life, or whatever you know. Documentaries are are sometimes. I mean, there's a huge surge of documentaries because of of COVID, which is you know a, a blessing and a curse in its own right here. And I've watched too many documentaries. To, to count, especially when I went back to, to school and film theory and all that stuff. What was the hardest scene for you to film in this documentary that just sticks with you as you either rewatch the film at film festivals or when you were doing the editing process? I mean, when you get into the Parkinson stuff, I guess some of that's a little, a little hard. What really got me was more this than watching it. I know it's hard when some people see it and then they see her going through what she's going through, you know? But for me, while I was working on the film, when I was scanning, you know, I went through all of our archives. So I scanned like 1600 photos and articles and just anything she had, because I didn't know what I was gonna need. So I did all that at her place. So I'd be in the living room and she'd be in her bedroom watching TV. You know, I might come across a photo of her and Cher and, somebody I didn't know. So I would go in there and I'd be like, oh, hey, who's this person? You know, who's that person? And she would say whatever. And what got me was I'm going through, you know, all of this stuff and it's all of her and it's her and her prime and all these articles. And when you said Valerie, there was only one Valerie. You know, if you look at Valerie now, like Valerie Bertinelli pops up first, which is weird to me. It's fine. We all love Valerie Bertinelli. I don't mean anything against it, but you know, it's Valerie Perrine. That was it. But, you know, seeing all these photos and going through all these years of her life and in her prime and then walking into the next room and there she is bedridden and going through this, you know, beginnings of this disease, you know, so that, that kind of hit me, you know, that would make me a little sad. And also recently I was going through some footage for something else and same thing, you know, uh, just watching these videos of me and her having our conversations, that kind of got me a little sad too, because again, she's in a different spot now than when I was filming her, you know? And I see her every day. I see her like five times a day. I'm the last person to see her at night, all that, you know? But that did give me a little sad because she's not going to be here forever. But for myself, I am lucky that I have all these things I can always go back on and look at of her and watch and you know, these moments we shared. Um, so I always have that. When you're doing this and you're doing it on someone that you care about and you love, you have that as a person. Like, oh, they're going through this thing. There's, you get emotions and, you know, sadness or happiness for triumph. You get something that's kind of hard to watch, but as a filmmaker, you're like, oh, wow, I just got some gold. That's going to be amazing. That may bring a tear to somebody's eye. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like this weird thing. It's like, oh, I'm kind of sad about this, but, oh, I'm really happy on this side of of the filmmaker aspect of it. But when I rewatch and edit interviews like this, there there'll be things that'll trigger be like, oh, this is a good clip that I could use elsewhere, and you know, I could put on social media and whatever to draw interest to get them. That's why I was going through some of that old stuff uh, when the film was going to be released. I was looking at you know old things where I could pull a little clip and maybe use it on social media, and, and you know, then you can pull down this rabbit hole of. Oh, I forgot all about that. Oh, what? oh, oh, wow. Oh, that's heavy. Or whatever it is, you know? And then you're like, get a little misty eyed. And you're like, it'll be okay. I'll just go see her right now, you know? And through Valerie, I'm going to cheers her now. You know, looking at film festivals, because of the pandemic, obviously film festivals were, were halted. And this documentary, I'm sure, uh, has made the rounds before. Tell us about the film festival circuit, at least from your documentary's perspective, because I'm sure that that's rather interesting to me because I love that in the weeds type thing. I had a plan for the film because of who it was. And, you know, it's about Valerie Prine and what she's going through. There were just so many levels where I thought this film is the one film that could possibly get to the Academy Awards that I'll ever do. My focus was more on Academy, uh, Academy qualifying festivals. I mean, geez, anybody that's gone the festival circuit, and I was very specific. I probably submitted to, I don't know, 25 festivals or something. And I I think I got in 
those academy ones, I think I got in like six or so. Um, I won, you know, I won a couple of them. Uh, I think I won maybe like three. I mean, that's part of the landscape of, especially when you're an independent film, you know, it's not like, it's weird too. Like you think like, oh, like Sundance will love this. And then Sundance doesn't want it or whoever doesn't want it. And then somebody else wants you're like, so weird what, what they're looking for that year. And that, and that's the way it is. It doesn't matter. It could, your film can be great, but maybe it's just not what they're looking for that year. You know, actually, I just was in a film festival called the Da Vinci International Film Festival. If you are a filmmaker and looking for a festival, this is a boutique festival. It's great. Super great people. I won the film, well, the film won uh, their top award. It's called the Leo. Um, amazing, beautiful award. It's like a 17 pound bust of Leonardo da Vinci. It's, it's beautiful. And it now resides at Valerie's in between her BAFTA and her crystal uh, can base that she won. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the way I look at it is if you're a filmmaker, make your film, whatever it takes to get your film done. If you have an idea and you have the passion, you know, I know money is always an issue, but do whatever you can to, to make it happen and put it out there. You know, it, even if, you know, if you get in film festivals that you, you want, that's a win for you. You know, I mean, every film isn't going to make it to Netflix or Amazon or whatever it is, you know, but just having your, your film out there in the public and being recognized and shown, I mean, that's a win for anybody. I think. Is that going to be one of your plans to approach the streaming services to see if they'll, they'll take the documentary? It has distribution. Netflix, I literally got in touch with them right when the pandemic started, March, maybe April of 2020. They saw it. They liked it. It wasn't for them at that moment. HBO Max loved it. They loved Valerie. That wasn't really the way that they were trying to go younger, like a younger audience. PBS loved it. Their slate was full. Plus, one of the things is, I think it was a feature. Well, I know if it would have, been, if I would have kept it as a feature, I think it would have been an easier sell for some of those places because, you know, it's thirty-seven minutes. That's a weird amount of time for some of these places, you know. Uh, but luckily, uh, I did get distribution, and it's available on Apple TV, iTunes, YouTube. Google Play, the DVD is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. If you want to see it, if you want to stream it or whatever, go to ValerieMovie.com and all those links are there. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Wow, that's a good question. Oh, wow. Let me think about that for a minute. My answer is going to be a little different from what you're asking, but mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm going to put it more towards film, like documentary. Because with a documentary, I mean, that's, you can put a message out there. And with this film, part of the message was, you know, because what Valerie's going through, and, and she agreed to show that part of her life, what she's going through now, you know, she wanted to be an inspiration for other people going through stuff, you know, be it Parkinson's or cancer or mental illness, or you're just having, going through a bad patch in life, you know, just to show that inspiration of keep moving forward, don't give up. That's a very powerful tool, you know. I think that documentaries give a voice to things that need a voice. There's Parkinson's, because I'm, I'm talking about that because I know about that. You know, Michael J. Fox is the face of Parkinson's, and everybody knows about that. But on a smaller scale, like what Valerie's going through, putting that word out there, a disease can happen to anybody. You know, everybody thinks of Valerie Bryan, and they think, Movie star, Superman, uh, Lenny, you know, one of the most beautiful women you've ever seen, Playboy, all that stuff. You know, she lives in Beverly Hills in a mansion. She's jet setting and all that. And that's just not the way, you know, the world really is. So just showing that anything can happen to anyone and people are struggling all over. And it's, you know, it's kind of how you deal with, with the struggle you're dealt. What's your creative kryptonite? I would say getting money for projects. I mean, I'm sure that's what everybody says, but you've got to have money to, to make things. I mean, I was lucky with my film just because I had my own equipment. I just kind of shot it when I wanted and where people, when people were available and whatnot. I mean, this film took, I started shooting when she had that surgery 
like the end of January 2014. I would say the movie was totally done 2019. So that's a long time, but also I wasn't in a rush and it worked out because as I was shooting, her health was, what was going on with that was unfolding too. You know, so it worked out for, for what I was doing. I didn't need money like with the shooting thing. Later on, I needed money for, you know, all the post-production stuff, editing, sound, color, to get somebody to make the amazing uh, posters and all that stuff. I needed money for all that stuff. So I would say that money with any, any filmmaker is going to be like, money's the biggest obstacle when you're making something. When you tell someone that you're a director and they're not in the industry, what is the most misunderstood aspect that they think of your profession? Oh, they think like you're like you have money. <laughs> you know, when you say those things, you're like, oh, well, you have a movie. Like, oh, you must be rich. You're what? What are you doing? What's your next thing or whatever? You know. But I think, you know, maybe they really don't understand it. But I think most of the time it comes down. They think you're because you did a film that you're that you have a lot of money or something. I mean, what's kind of crazy is I have a high school reunion coming up, and I I can't make it. You know, I, I wanted to go and everything. Like I'd love to go. And, you know, I'm from a big, small town, so they probably think I'm a bigger deal than I am, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, it looks good on paper. I have street cred. You know, my movie was being considered for the Oscars. I've won awards. I've, you know, I know celebrities or whatever. You know what I mean? But that's just what this life is, you know? It's just normal. It's not that impressive. If, you know, it's just a normal day. It's like when you, you, when you live wherever you live and you know, the mayor, for some reason, it's like, oh, you know the mayor. Wow, that's really cool. It's the same thing as if you know here, it's like, oh, I know Valerie Perrine. I mean, it's a little bit different than knowing the mayor because it's Valerie Perrine. Yeah. But you know what I mean. What is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that stuck with you in your career? Oh, you ask good questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure somebody said this to me. You know, I, I think I try to live like this. If you have an idea, uh, just go after it. You know, try not to let things hold you back. If you have an idea and you're a filmmaker and you have equipment, go ahead and try to start shooting stuff. Don't wait if you can't get the cash to do it. One thing I learned from making this film, a lot of these friends of Valerie's and these people, they were all older. And you don't know what's going to happen with somebody's help. They can be great and, oh, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. And then they get sick or something. You know, I literally, I shot Alex Rocco, didn't say anything about it. He was sick, you know, he looked great and everything. Then he passed away like, you know, several months later. Dick Van Patten, you know, I shot Dick, you know, I did some interview stuff with him. Great and everything. I, it just didn't quite fit into the film. So I used all this archive footage of him because he and Valerie, they're, they're family basically, you know. One thing is, like, if you have to shoot anybody that's older, shoot them as soon as you can, get as much as you can out of them, just in case, because you never know. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? You know, it's, I hope my answers aren't too boring, but Valerie, literally, I wouldn't have the life I have right now if it wasn't for Valerie. You know, Valerie and I met, we live in the same neighborhood. We met in 2006, Walking Dogs. We literally bumped into each other. There was a whole long story about it. Through whatever, we became really close friends. And, you know, we just became really close, like family. And if it wasn't for that meeting, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I wouldn't met David Arquette. I wouldn't have been thrown into filmmaking. I wouldn't have made this film. I wouldn't be talking to you. Like, because of her, that that inspired me, but it also changed the course of my life. I thank her every day, uh, you know, mentally or, or whatnot. But, you know, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. And that will always uh, be a piece of my, my heart, you know. She gave me this incredible gift, letting me do this film with her and just being my friend, you know. And so many things came from that. 
From a professional standpoint, you are a director, a successful director of that. You are an award-winning director as well, too. I, you can put that on the on the paper, on the street cred there. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? It's weird because I don't. I think back to actors, you know, if you don't know what's going to happen next. You may be on a series, you could lead, and then that's it. That's all you ever do. In my case, you know, it's weird because I feel like, what is it, the imposter syndrome? Is it, I think that's what it's called. You do something great or whatever, and then, you know, people are thinking you're all this, but then in your mind, you're like, oh, they're going to find out. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, it's like, I have no idea how I did that, or, you know, maybe that was a fluke or, or whatever. I think I have that. You know, I am working on other things. I have other projects that I'm, I'm working on uh, getting made and whatnot. You know, there's that little thing in the back of your mind where you're like, oh, they're going to find me out. <laughs> they're going to find out, you know, that was a that was a, a luck thing. But it's not. I have that little bit of a, I guess, that imposter syndrome. You're not the only one that said that. A lot of a lot of creative people I've I've interviewed, introverted or extroverted, have said the imposter syndrome is a, is a real thing, and, and I yeah. I can agree with it. It's just that self-doubt that, especially as creative people, that we all have where we don't think we're good enough and the, and the world is more than willing to say you're not good enough. Oh, thousand percent. And just think back through time, how many of like the greatest artists that the world has known, they got no respect when they were, you know, when, when they were literally dying for their art. And then they die and then it's discovered. And then, you know, it's the greatest thing, you know, their masterpieces in every museum. But when they were doing it, you know, they got nothing. And I'm sure they were like, oh, why am I doing this? Like, I'm really no good. Nobody cares. Or, but it's that thing of, you know, they have that burning passion inside of them. What I think, is it Hemingway? Maybe it was um, a Bukowski. Yeah. I think it was like, oh, writing's easy. You just have to, you just have to cut yourself open and, bleed every word or something. I can't remember it's not the exact thing, but it's, you know, it's true. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, failure is tough. I think that anybody that's creative, anybody that's put their heart into their art, whatever it is, um, I think you have an idea of how you how it's going to be perceived, uh, you know, a hope, a dream, and you don't know. It's a, you know, it's a crapshoot. You never know what's gonna what you're gonna get. But I think if your life is art, you know, that's part of the road. There's going to be bumps in the road. People aren't going to get what you're doing at the time, or it may not work. But I think every failure is actually a success because you actually put your heart and soul into something and you created something from, you had an idea and you brought it to fruition. So even if the world doesn't see what you were trying to do, you succeeded as you went from the initial idea to the completion of the idea. So that, I think that's a success. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an actor or a director or something creative in some way shape or form how can they inspire the generation that follows them well it's crazy because now everything's so ah, social media you know mm -hmm. instagram tiktok influencers and all that it's and it, believe me there's tons of people that are creative and that are doing amazing things but you know i feel also there's a little bit of a there's a cheat to it you know, it's all about, oh, let me take a picture of this food. Let me take a picture where I'm here. And it's like, that's not your real life. It's all kind of fake. To inspire, I guess, the, the generation now, to inspire the generation coming up, you know, I think just be genuine. So I think that the generation now, they should share their knowledge, what they think is successful or what worked for them and what they see the future being. Break the rules, you know? I, I'm going to bring Valerie up again. Valerie is an icon because she did things that other people didn't do. She said whatever was on her mind. She did things that other people wouldn't do. I mean, I don't know if you know this, she was the first topless woman on American television. Like she's an icon, you know, people didn't do that. She broke down these barriers that a lot of people don't know that she did, you know? 
like she spoke her mind in a time when women weren't doing that. You know, if you ask her a question, she said what she thought. She didn't sugarcoat it. It wasn't her trying to make the studio happy. You know, she did what she wanted to do. And, you know, she's an icon and a trailblazer in that way. And I think that's the way that people should live their lives. And I think that whatever generation should look to past generations for inspiration. Everybody has their, oh, I, you know, their James Dean fan or Marilyn Monroe or, or whatever, you know, whatever, wherever you can get a source of inspiration and dreams. I mean, come on, we all end up in Hollywood or wherever doing, trying to make a movie or art, whatever we want to do, because someone inspired us as, as a child. It could be your art teacher, it could be Steven Spielberg, whatever it is. But it all starts with being inspired and, and following your dreams. If your life was a film, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Wow, you ask good questions, man. Usually they're all kind of cookie cutter. That's why this is good. That's why I'm like, oh, hold on, I gotta think for a second. <laughs> I mean, I know the soundtrack, the soundtrack's easy. Uh, title's a little tougher. Um, okay, okay. I mean, this is, isn't a great title, <laughs> but because this is something that the way I kind of lived my life, this is why I came here. I don't want to be 75 and say, what if? The whole thing was I always wanted to be an actor. As a kid growing up, movies, TV, that was my passion, you know, from literally three years old on, like, I saw it, I did it, I watched it, whatever it was. And, you know, I wanted to be an actor. And that wasn't a, considered a real thing where I'm from, from like a big small town in Georgia. That wasn't real. I hit a point in my life and I thought, you know what? I was in my 20s. I was like, I don't want to be 75 and say, what if I did that? I, don't, I didn't want to regret not at least giving it a shot. And I thought, if it doesn't work out, something else will happen to me in California. And so that's the kind of what I thought when I moved here. And, you know, that actually happened. Like Acting didn't exactly work out. Look, I made a film. I fell into this world. So, you know, it worked out in the end. And a soundtrack. I mean, geez, come on. Uh, I guess it'd have to be some kind of like 70s, 80s soundtrack. Come on, man. That's like the lifeblood right there. <laughs> the good music. <laughs> good music. I mean, come on. You think back and it's like you hear a song and it transports you back to 1984 in print or whatever you know it's like music's huge well stacy i do hate to say it but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you so much for coming on the show well thank you for having me and this has been great and i'm gonna say you asked the best questions ever because i you know literally i had to stop and think about it. i'm like oh well what's oh i gotta think about that that's a good question so thank you for having me and uh, thank you for watching Valerie. And Where can we find you? How can we support Yeah, if you want to see Valerie, again, go to ValerieMovie.com. And there's also a GoFundMe for Valerie. And it's the link is on ValerieMovie. Uh, it's on ValerieMovie.com. Uh, and all that money goes to help her with her expenses and, you know, just her, uh, her medical needs. And uh, I'm going to say it now. Thank you from me. Thank you from her because it does make a huge difference. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. We can, you can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia and our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash tgtmedia. As I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.